join you in a couple of minutes. It's just a little bit closer. Diamond Center is a visiting scholar, but uh, you know, this three months period, it's very, very nice to be here with you and to uh, have this opportunity to show a little bit of my, of my work about learning games and creativity. And just so you know, I, I like to, I take presentations like this as conversation triggers. So I'm not committed to my 256 slides, kidding, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, only 105, uh, but I'm very much like you to jump in uh, as soon as you have questions or comments. It's uh, uh, not only, it's not a problem for me, I actually like this uh, uh, very much. So feel free and uh, uh, right now afterwards you can download, uh, if you find it interesting, you can download this presentation to, uh, through that uh, e address that's written on the board. So I'm the, the Lemon family right now, it's a mirror lens. All right, so, so let me map out uh, firstly for you uh, who am I, where I'm coming from and my emphasis today in this presentation. Uh, I'll mostly talk about the work I've been doing at Joy Street. It's a company I helped to, to start at the Posta Digital, which is a, it's a tech part in the city, uh, northeast in Brazil, which I'll be uh, showing you. Uh, I'm a co-founder and I invented, created to myself this funny uh, uh, appointment. It's called CSI, <laughs> I'm Joy Street <laughs> CSI, Chief of Science and Innovation. Um, and that will be my emphasis today, the work we've been doing there, the, the, the games we've been developing, and the research we've been uh, 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 doing there. But I'm also a uh, university professor uh, in the field of psychology. I uh, did undergraduate classes in cultural psychology and innovation. Uh, I used it to be, due 2014, also a member of the graduate group of cognitive psychology. Some of you may have heard about this group because they, uh, we worked a long time within the field of mathematics education and we actually created the expression street mathematics. Uh, this has been you know, circulating in conferences. It's, uh, it's a very interesting kind of research. In 2014, I uh, left that group and I left the full professorship at the Federal University precisely to uh, devote more time to choice Street. So uh, now I'm a part-time professor and giving that those uh, undergraduate classes. From year 2000, I've been also a consultant of, our, of CESA. CESA is Recipe Center for Advanced Studies and Strategies, helping them to uh, develop uh, uh, innovation projects in education. I'll talk a little bit about those uh, in a second. Uh, so because uh, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an academic, I couldn't be uh, out of a, a graduate program with a master's students, uh, at least. Uh, I joined uh, CESA's uh, uh, faculty team. CESA is also a, a school, a college, besides being a, uh, a, a non-profit innovation institution. Uh, it's got a, a, a faculty team that uh, uh, we organized again a graduate program in the design of digital artifacts. And there is also a graduate program, uh, it's a in Brazil professional master in software engineering, and then another one in designing, uh, in design of the digital artifacts. So I'm a uh, professional as well. And lately I've been uh, awarded a uh, scholarship from CMPQ, uh, CMPQ our federal agency for uh, the research development. Uh, it's called Technical Development and Innovation, so it's a, it's a very special kind of scholarship to develop uh, uh, innovation projects. Uh, so that's, that's more or less, uh, I'm gonna fly over some of my previous research just because I was very afraid of not having uh, many graphs and uh, tables to show you because of, uh, I, I know the, the tradition here. And this is just to show you that uh, my research is, is kind of very different actually. It comes from different traditions within discourse analysis, interaction analysis, video analysis, and all this, this kind of thing. So, uh, uh, so this, is, this is an example of uh, a 
a piece of research where I was uh, treating the, the problem of how kids give representations on paper about uh, uh, mathematical uh, problems they're taking in. Uh, and this is showing, I mean, this is very fine-grained microgenetic analysis showing how paper representations interact with uh, uh, the kinds of thinking that the kids were developing. And in this sense, paper representations are not just the deployment of thinking, but uh, helps and actually structures thinking in, in various ways. Uh, so this is just uh, to show you that I, I do do research, but I do not produce too many graphs. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I will show graphs today. Uh, I mean, this goes on and on. I left the field of mathematics education like 10 years ago, but got, uh, stayed in the classroom only that in the capacity of uh, uh, studying communication and dialogue within the classroom, uh, be it uh, in the field of uh, you know, uh, using education software or uh, very little kids uh, interacting with the teachers. So if by any chance, any of you would like uh, within the Lemon Center to work with video, I'd love to, to, to participate in your research projects because that, that's one thing that excites me a lot. All right, so within CESA, uh, just to not, I mean, this is very quick and I'll get to it. <laughs> uh, I have helped uh, uh, to develop uh, projects such as uh, uh, the NAVI project as I, at the high school. Uh, actually, two sites of high schools in Brazil, one in Recife, one in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and I just said Rio de Janeiro, just like an American would like to say, <laughs> right name is Rio de Janeiro. Uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro, what's that? <laughs> uh, and we teach, uh, CESA uh, actually helped to structure this project, and we teach uh, 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 programming based on the, the immersion of kids in a, a game environment. So they actually built, developed, uh, ever since conception to development, uh, games. And this is a project that Fabio Campos here knows very much because he was a director of OI, Institute OI, uh, which sponsored this project. So uh, Fabio, uh, I think for two years, right? Two years. So he, 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 was, uh, he was the head of this program within OI, and I was the educational consultant within CESA. And then we did some others for uh, uh, Coca-Cola and uh, uh, governments such as the government of Minas Gerais. Sorry, Lucy. Yes. Others probably know that uh, I don't. Maria away from Ireland. Could you just say a word about CESAR itself? Please? Okay, CESAR is a, a, a non-profit organization uh, that was born within the Federal University of Pernambuco in the Department of Computer Science from uh, uh, where uh, I'm the board. Paulo comes. Okay. Uh, he is at the, the board of CESAR. Yeah. Uh, I'm just a consultant. <laughs> uh, and this, this happened 17 years ago. And the, uh, and CESA actually helped to, 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 to give a start to the, the tech park yeah. in Recife. The That's very first, uh, it's a company, it's a big company, yeah. like 600 uh, employees and 7 million, uh, uh, 7 million reais a year and in revenues. 7 million reais is like $25 million. But it's 20 million. It started as a consulting arm of the computer science department, is that right? Uh, as I started as a, uh, actually, pretty much the way it is, I mean, developing projects for uh, the market to, and one of the, the main uh, goals was to retain students being uh, 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 formed by the, the, the yeah. Department of Computer Science because they're all fleeing away to Sao Paulo and Rio to better <laughs> jobs and everything. Palo Alto. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> Palo Alto, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Microsoft. <laughs> Microsoft, uh, yeah, absolutely. So, is that, is that enough? Thank you very okay. much. Thank That's you. great. That's great. So, you gave me the chance to talk a little bit more about CESA. Mm -hmm. It's uh, very much uh, fun. Mm -hmm. So, and this leads me to Joy Street. Uh, we started Joy Street uh, ten, uh, not ten, five years ago only. So, it's a, it's a startup. Uh, 
a little bit bigger than the regular startup in Brazil. And I'm going to tell you what, what we've been doing, uh, the kinds of learning games we've been developing, and uh, uh, the impact we've been uh, getting in, in Brazil. But before I do that, let me tell you a little bit about Recife because it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it gives you a context and, uh, of, of this, uh, whatever we're doing. <laughs> so this is Recife. It's a big city, as you see. Uh, in the foreground, you see actually the city of Olinda which is a historical uh, town, one of the oldest in Brazil. Um, <clears throat> Recife is 1.65 million people, uh, large and the eight, uh, largest GDP amongst the uh, metropolitan areas in Brazil. So it's, a, it's quite a, a, a big place uh, for our standards, of course. Uh, and uh, where you see those, uh, that, that harbor over there is actually our, uh, it became 15 years ago, our digital park. Uh, the entire, this entire island, which is Recife's old town, historical town, became, uh, uh, by way of a strategic uh, governmental plan, a, a digital uh, park, a tech park. Sorry. Um, and so Cesar is located uh, right over there. City Hall, uh, that's the that's a, a, a management for the digital park. Uh, even uh, some state departments uh, secretaries are placed in here, and this is uh, uh, with, with, of course, the exception of the tight, tall buildings, uh, they are all uh, um, uh, historical buildings. And this is the ground zero, which I'm showing you right now. Uh, Recife was dominated by the Dutch for almost 40 years <laughs> in, the, in the 70th century. Uh, today, Recife used to be the capital of the entire Dutch country in Brazil, and this uh, with the, the synagogue. Yes, the, well, this is very interesting. You reminded me of this because Recife also has the first synagogue of, of the entire uh, Americas, uh, and it, it. They say that the the Jews that founded Manhattan came it's from true. Recife, and this is correct. <laughs> So uh, we found in New York. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, they're responsible for the foundation of New York, and uh, all these buildings now are. <laughs> Pernambucanos are very much like this, you know. We blow things out of proportion. Thank you. <laughs> uh, times. Actually, we say that we 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 started the ocean, uh, the Atlantic Ocean by the encounter of rivers that <laughs> cut receives <laughs> through. Uh, all right, so these, all these buildings are now a uh, 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 tech-related uh, uh, companies. And of course, I mean, just so you know, this is the same place that uh, houses Carnival during, uh, I mean, for a period of like four days or five, six days, 10 days from now, so, and I'm here. <laughs> Not with this crowd, the streets, the streets get crowded. All right, so let's start actually some <laughs> doing something here. So our mission at Joy Street is to create innovative learning scenarios based on dialogue and fun. And this, we take this uh, uh, very seriously, the idea of uh, game environments that triggers dialogue because we, we, we see it, uh, dialogue as one of the foundations of learning through fun, through engagement that uh, we can trigger uh, through fun. So we have this uh, three, uh, uh, I'll say minor goals, which is gamification, use uh, gamification in video game, uh, classical mechan mechanics, mechanics, mechanics for engagement. So, which is to say that we are not trying to reinvent uh, the way games are played. We are taking what we call classical mechanics like River Raid, uh, uh, Angry Birds, I mean mechanics people use a mic uh, to build learning games. So it's not, you see the kinds of things we're uh, building right now uh, in, a, in a second. Um, but we, we're not focusing only on the gamification and, and the video game mechanics, but, but also in uh, structuring uh, new school dynamics 
and social arrangements for learning. So as you see, the kinds of things we are offering are not only the video game platforms, but also the environments uh, that structure, uh, structure new classroom arrangements within schools. And uh, we have a, a, a third goal, which is in construction, with it, which is building uh, towards game-based assessment. We uh, want to use our, our game platforms to uh, uh, not only to uh, so kids can can perform better at schools, but to use them to assess uh, and evaluate uh, the way kids are learning. All right. So, what's the context for this? Uh, I mean, these these stats are known to probably to everybody here, just uh, showing them to perhaps um, remind you that we are in <laughs> big, big trouble uh, in terms of uh, not only uh, uh, retaining kids to school, but in uh, uh, bringing them to a learning track that uh, makes sense and produces uh, a, a, a more a better performance at, at the end. And so, so as you see here, uh, it's about 27% uh, of kids who enter elementary school finish high school, and of those who finish, only 10% uh, on average uh, display a, a, a reasonable performance in mathematics. Uh, Portuguese uh, language studies is a bit better, it's about 25% but it's still uh, uh, amazingly low. Um, so it's the 41% versus the 27 so high school, it's the 41%. Yeah, only 41 graduate from elementary school oh, before school. going to uh, high school. And from those who go, mm -hmm. only 27, 27%. Uh, so it's middle school. Yeah, it's middle school. Yeah, <laughs> only graduate uh, middle school, that's right. Um, so, of course, this is a humongous problem, enormous problem, uh, and we, we, I mean, it's multifarious, there's many factors affecting this, but we would like to, uh, at Choice Street, we, we have uh, built this notion of uh, how pedagogical innovation is to enter the classrooms, and we, we of course, have seen that everybody perhaps would agree with me that uh, this is not a problem of computation. I mean, it's not a matter of, of putting uh, computers in the classrooms. I take this, uh, you know, two pictures just, just to contrast. Uh, classrooms uh, 100 years apart, they have different technologies. Uh, the one in this size, plenty of digital technologies, but they have the same social arrangement and they, uh, uh, they exercise the same, very same types of didactic practices. And that's, that's a, that is what we wanted to change with uh, a uh, uh, new, new kinds of pedagogy. So we created like a, what we call, uh, we named the pedagogy of bits. So how to take computation in a pedagogy that makes sense teachers, to kids, to managers, to principals, etc. Uh, there are many ways to, to conceptually structure a pedagogy like this. I know it from the work of Paulo Blinkstein and most people within the Lerman Center, you guys use constructivism, constructionist and critical pedagogy, uh, which is a very interesting way to, to do it. Uh, my master's, uh, <laughs> Uh, thesis from like 30 years ago was uh, on Puppert's book, Mindstorm, so I'm, I'm very fond of, of his work and of course the work uh, Blickstein has, has done here. And this is one way to, to, to do it and that's pretty much, uh, I like it because it summarizes uh, some of the conceptual background we're uh, uh, looking at. Uh, so we want games to provide a immersive experience uh, so kids can learn in meaningful ways. So games has this property, I mean, uh, tentatively, games are uh, able, uh, are tools that can help create this, this environment. As uh, 
James Koshi would say, and this is a, a very known author uh, within this field, uh, games provide uh, learning that, that is in situ and in time. Just in time, the idea that you, as you play a game, you are immersed in an environment, a digital environment that uh, only, only uh, uh, requests your action uh, and gives you challenges uh, in a very well designed way so that uh, the learning that you, you, you build is in, in time and it makes sense uh, to, to emerge at that specific time and there is a contest to it. So, uh, and that's the way, a way at least, uh, that we can uh, take this meaning. And, uh, but it's not, as I said, it's not all about games per se, but uh, the practices that uh, uh, surrounds those games. And so to, uh, to originate those uh, social, new social arrangements we're looking for. Uh, so I'll show how we do this. And then hopefully we involve uh, uh, this uh, uh, makes kids and teachers to do the better uh, and more interesting school community uh, and uh, structure identity, uh, identities uh, amongst kids. Is this okay? Can I just go for it? So this is sort of the conceptual thing. I'm, heading now to, to show you how the gaming industry is structured and then after that uh, get to Joy Street. Uh, I needed to, and I didn't know how much background <laughs> everybody would have, so I sort of, uh, but again, if you want to uh, stop me, please. Um, so as you may know, the gaming industry is huge. Uh, uh, this is a, uh, world having revenue of games uh, just in 2016 is about a hundred billion dollars. Uh, this is worldwide uh, in the year uh, 2016 and expected to uh, to come to uh, almost 120 billion uh, only two years from now. So um, and this is about double uh, the the movie industry in the world. So it's, it's amazing. High. But uh, this is entertainment, right? This is games in general, everything. Learning games are uh, included here, but it takes, it's, it's about only one and a half to 2% of the, of the entire market. And this, uh, this two headlines uh, gives this, this notion. <laughs> Uh, Supercell is a very well-known company. Uh, they, they, they build uh, uh, Clash of Clans, for instance, it's one, one of the most famous uh, entertainment games in the world. And Supercell is just one company in, uh, uh, in 2015 made $2.3 uh, $2 billion uh, with three games. Uh, the entire learning games industry in the world is expected to, uh, to generate 2.3 billion, the same value, <laughs> in 2017, by the end of this year. So just to give you a, 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 you know, a very constructing, uh, contrasting uh, picture of the, of the entire thing. Uh, in Brazil is a very uh, uh, emergent market within the gaming industry. This is a recent uh, report from the NDS, the National Bank for Social Development in Brazil, uh, uh, showing that uh, the majority of the industry, game industry in Brazil, is our, this is not cons consumption of games, right? This is production of games in Brazil. Uh, in, consumption, in consumption of games, we're the fourth market in the world. So we, we consume a lot, we produce, we develop very little. So uh, almost 75% of all games, uh, all uh, game companies in Brazil uh, have an annual revenue of uh, less than uh, $100,000. <laughs> so it's, it's nothing. So uh, thank God, uh, uh, choice to this level. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you know any employment figures? Unemployment figures. Employment in the game. Employment. Um, I don't have it 
right now, but I can easily get it this to you. Yes. Um, Pernambuco is the fourth uh, state in the country with uh, the more uh, uh, companies working with this. So first is Sao Paulo, then Rio Grande do Sul, Rio de Janeiro, and all these things. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm citing nothing. Anyway. Yeah, but it's still very close to yeah, it's, Sao Paulo is a clear yeah. outlier, but the other ones. So this can be like very small companies also. Most of yeah, them are. Yeah, yeah. So they're, you know, very <coughs> niche startups. So that's a, that's a industry, right? Uh, also in Brazil. And now we're uh, diving into the world of learning games. Uh, and although very small, uh, the market has been uh, getting stronger and stronger, especially uh, in a way it's uh, uh, finally demonstrating that there is impact, there is an effect. And usually, uh, although there are controversies, usually a, a positive impact on learning uh, as, as I mean, it, uh, it gets to the science magazine already and this is a compilation of some studies showing how um, games and these are not even games, not all of them are games designed specifically for education. Uh, some of them are like virtual cell and it shows like in, in different, for different audiences and different subjects, uh, school subjects. Uh, <clears throat> learning games are just starting to show the impact on, on how classrooms are structured and how kids learn. So this is, this is quite amazing actually because it's a very uh, young uh, line of research. So it's like 15 years, 20 years uh, old, most uh, uh, at most. Um, and uh, half of this time was lost actually trying to show that violent video games were not good for kids. <laughs> <laughs> and so the real research trying to, okay, so now that we know that violent video games may not be very good for kids because not even that was very well demonstrated. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what we can do, so researchers started to uh, 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 pay attention to how uh, games can actually impact learning. And there is a special, a very particular area of this kind of research, which is called uh, uh, brain train, BT games, or brain train games, it's been uh, getting a lot of attention, and it's in a nature already. Uh, and showing how things like cognitive priming, uh, I mean, the, how executive functions are activated by the, the different kinds of games and people get, uh, like in here, uh, getting uh, much more, uh, uh, are not as uh, um, in risk uh, of proficiency as in a control group, the yellow shows that it, using this kind of training uh, uh, with games, you uh, reduce uh, uh, people's uh, unpromptness to uh, problem solving. Is that is that clear? Kind of. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's uh, clear. It's just whether we believe it or not. <laughs> okay. Uh, Proficiency in what? Yeah. Uh, in mathematical problem solving, they 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 uh, arrange a, a bunch of different kinds of tasks, cognitive tasks, mm -hmm. and uh, this BT is a very special kind of game that it's uh, it's uh, it's more for I mean it's like games you play for like five ten minutes only mm -hmm. to active activate what they call executive functions and so on. This is more of the sign uh, a neuroscience people are doing. Yeah. That's not the kind of like thing. Rebus games? Rebus games? Rebus? Rebus. Sorry, I, I can uh, I, I don't know this. Uh, what's a good explanation of that? It, it has to do with cognitive training. Yes. Uh, improve uh, math skills, but it's verbal interactive over the, over the internet. Uh, oh, like Shutterbot? No. Uh, 
Umbernet is the company. Okay. Uh, anyway. No, I, I haven't heard of it. <laughs> but, okay, it's interesting. Uh, but the point is that, I mean, in, people have shown this and that, uh, not without controversy, as you see. I mean, it, it get also, this gets, uh, has been getting to the uh, popular uh, science media, like Scientific American, but not without controversy. And so in 2016, you had like two different articles from the same magazine showing you know, different things. <laughs> so this is why gaming could be the future of education. And uh, that's an article written by a different person in the same uh, magazine, Fact or Fiction, which video games are the future of education. Uh, so there's lots of controversy. Uh, and by the way, all these things I'm, I'm quoting are at the Bitly uh, link that you, but you can also download on the entire presentation. Um, so, but, okay, so uh, this said, what should we do? So there is this one study, this is a meta-analytical study that's perhaps the most interesting among all the meta-analysis in the field of uh, uh, learning games that I've seen uh, from Douglas Clark at uh, Vanderbilt University and his, his uh, colleagues uh, that I, I, I take to be the, the, the more complete. They started analyzing 77,000 77, uh, papers related to the field of games as the most complete study so far. Of course, they ended up with uh, 100 studies <laughs> because there are bunch of futures to you know get out the, uh, the I mean the un uninteresting stuff uh, studies not uh, well described studies not about games at all blah, blah, blah. but they ended up with a, a, a very uh, interesting bunch of uh, games and the idea was to okay so uh, the central question was uh, is are games impactful in education at all and and I think their analysis is very interesting, and I would like just to read this to four passages for you. Uh, the presented meta-analysis suggests that games as a medium can indeed support productive learning, uh, uh, taken from the kinds of things they've seen. Games as a medium dif definitely uh, provide new and powerful affordances, but it is the design within the medium to leverage those affordances that will determine the efficacy, the efficacy of a learning environment. This is, this is very interesting. So getting to the, the last one, we should just shift emphasis from proof of concept studies, uh, the kinds of questions they started with. Can games support learning? Which they already said, I mean, uh, it's, uh, we think we, uh, from this meta-analysis, we think we should say yes. Uh, but leave this aside, and leave aside media comparison analysis. Are games better or worse than uh, other media for learning? Two, uh, cognitive consequences and value-added studies exploring how theoretically driven design decisions, and that's where I, I would like to focus very much uh, the rest of my, of my talk, of my dialogue with you, uh, how these drive uh, uh, theoretically driven design decisions influence situated learning outcomes for the broad diversity of learning, learners within and beyond our classrooms. So what principles are these that we uh, can actually design environments to improve learning at base game uh, uh, learning, right? So. All right, so uh, firstly, therefore, we have to uh, show what games are. And uh, this, this is a, a, a photo of a game I like very much. It's great. Uh, and I like it because uh, it, there is a, a, a time tunnel that you can uh, rewind time in the game. So you don't have, if you, if you make a mistake, you don't have to go to, <laughs> to the beginning of the phase. You just, you know. You can repeat that action and try again. So, because I'm very bad at games, so I like to. <laughs> this, this is a nice environment to play. So, playing a game, and this comes uh, mostly from uh, my reflection on uh, Bernard uh, Stutz, uh, the philosopher from Michigan University. No, uh, 
he's passed like 10 years ago. I can't quite remember where he's coming from. But he's just a philosopher, American uh, philosopher. Uh, so uh, from his work, we can uh, actually say that playing a game is a voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles in the least efficient ways, adding value and meaning to a narrative designed to offer players an emotional experience. Right? Um, so this is a, a broader, the broader context in which we have been uh, designing, uh, as uh, Douglas Clark has mentioned, uh, added value uh, principles to uh, game design. So our secret, what we call our secret sauce, has been actually to uh, mirror uh, school dynamics to uh, game mechanics. So our entire attempt to build uh, well-designed games, as uh, uh, James Fuji said, is to uh, sort of transform as, mass, as, as much as we can from the curriculum into our narrative. Curriculums are, are usually and traditionally just lists, content lists. So how can we uh, transform that in a narrative? That's a, a very important question for us game designers. I'm not a game designer, by the way. I'm a professor of psychology, <laughs> just so you know. I've been, I've been working, as I said, uh, uh, very close to game designers and uh, technical people to do this, but I'm not a game designer per se. Um, and these are the, the kinds of contrasting uh, conceptual models we've been uh, working with. So we are uh, sort of uh, uh, taking the curriculum away from information-based procedural knowledge to situated meanings and models. Just like in the, uh, Wenger and, and Leif's uh, 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 a diagram that I showed you before, right? So, I mean, it's too long to go uh, step by step, and I, I want in my remaining time to actually show you the games we, we've uh, developed. But the idea is uh, just one more, is, is to uh, not to have as much instructional objects as in, uh, in traditional classrooms, which are designed uh, uh, mostly to information delivery, but to have learning objects uh, in the that are immersive sense making based on a college of activities that kids and teachers realize within the classroom. Again, just like Leibs and Wingers framework. Um, this is interesting because, and this is true for English as well, in Portuguese, uh, learning and teachers in teaching are not reciprocal actions, uh, should be, <laughs> but uh, as they are in other languages. Um, so there's this professor of mine who used to uh, tell this joke: uh, if a, a car seller uh, sells other, uh, you know, tell other car seller that in that week uh, they sell ten cars, but nobody buy, bought them, uh, that would be nonsense, right? But we as teachers usually say uh, in that in that uh, framework that we taught like ten topics in mathematics. Uh, nobody learned, but uh, it's not our fault. Uh, and, 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 this, and this is to think not of instructional objects and, but, and learning objects. This is very much like uh, saying the same thing as uh, a, a, a student-centered uh, education and so on, although I prefer saying that is because of our emphasis in dialogue, I prefer saying that education should be centered, should be centered in uh, teacher-student uh, uh, relationships. Okay, so we transformed all this in a formula. <laughs> it's just a way to uh, kid uh, with the, the idea. And in Portuguese, of course, it's played play better because uh, we want to change the, the entire school genetics. <laughs> uh, to, not to, uh, to, to change the school DNA to a D3NA. Again, it plays very in Portuguese. If you download the presentation, you can see that the, the first D is for uh, fun. <laughs> uh, the second D uh, is for dialogue. It's okay. And the third one is for uh, this a few, which is challenge. 
so fun dialogue and challenge makes up for the entire uh, kind of game mechanics that we want to use in schools and that and of course now I hope you have understood I'm not talking about the kinds of the educational games that uh, most people have seen but a, uh, a new entire uh, entirely new generation of learning games uh, and that's one of the reasons we, we changed the name from educational games to learning games. Um, okay so Joystick has built a number of uh, <coughs> platforms for elementary, upper elementary, high schools, and also more, more, more recently uh, to uh, uh, professional uh, technical uh, development, technical, oops, sorry. Um, so, of course, this is also not entirely new. Many other companies have been building uh, very interesting learning games. I mean, I, I'd like to offer the way we see conceptually this and the research we've done uh, surrounding all this, this stuff. So just to give you a hint, uh, this is this is not ours. <laughs> I wish it was. <laughs> uh, this is has uh, Blue Penguin. It's got like 120 million uh, users in the world. It's amazing. It's a, a very interesting entertainment uh, uh, architecture. Then we reverse engineered to do this. <laughs> this is fun. This is Joy Street's stuff. So it's just, just a way to show that we do. Uh, I mean, I hope you know that it is okay. It's not illegal to do this, okay? <laughs> uh, you can take game mechanics. I mean, actually, there are only uh, about uh, less than 100 game mechanics in the entire world, right? So they are not infinite. They're not infinite. Uh, so we can take and do this. This is for kids in public schools in Brazil with a nice aesthetics, nice quality. Uh, this was built actually, and this was a, a, a strategic, strategic, strategic ah, decision uh, to build it in Flash because uh, we know that Flash is not a good, very good technology and actually it's been discontinued. <laughs> But this was really flash because that was the only technology that could run in school computers at the time we built this. So sometimes you have to make decisions like this and actually have a to to port the entire game to construct or unit or whatever later on because first you have to get the kids to do this stuff, right? You you had it first. So this uh, idea of uh, hundred uh, platforms. So is that the norm in the industry to everyone uses the same platforms and no intellectual property issues or? Mechanics, same mechanics, uh, not platforms, but the same oh, mechanics. mechanics. You see, the platforms are the very logic. different. The logic of building, the logic of having a, a, a plateau like this where people can interact, this is okay. What you can do is to, uh, for instance, among other things, but for instance, to uh, replicate the levels of difficulty because that is a mark of the way uh, uh, that you engage people, right? So it's like books. Now, you can use words. <laughs> there are not so many. Uh, there are only, I don't know, 30,000 words in English language, 30,000, about that. So uh, you can use them. But uh, if you repeat uh, too many of them in a certain order, then you that's splashing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so and, and within those platforms, uh, so there's nothing to do with learning yet, but within that those platforms, we can get kids to uh, to uh, be curious about um, synonyms, right? So this this is a particular subject in Brazilian uh, elementary schools. No, I have no idea why they <laughs> choose to teach this, uh, but it is. So you know this game from Robin, it's uh, Angry Birds, right? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, seven uh, billion downloads, right? It's about that, seven billion downloads. It's like the, everybody in the planet is playing this. <laughs> oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, it's playing that game. Uh, but we took that mechanics and we built one uh, where instead of uh, 
uh, throwing uh, birds against uh, poor pigs, uh, the kid has to choose a uh, icon that's got a meaning, right? It can be a, a sword, it can be, uh, I mean, a representation of whatever, uh, love or abstract, abstract or concrete <laughs> concepts, and throw towards a uh, structure that's uh, uh, it's made up of, of words. And this structure, just, just like in the Angry Birds game, this structure is broken in different parts differently if the icon uh, matches the meaning of the word. Is that clear? So, and the idea is here, it's not that the game will stop and say, oh, you just found a synonym. Synonyms are et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or give kids a definition, but to trigger conversation between kids and teachers, among te uh, kids and teachers within schools, within classrooms, and change those social arrangements I was talking about. So this is what we call, uh, and, 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 and very in line with the uh, uh, theoretical scheme I showed you, uh, this is what we call peripheral learning participation. So kids are participating within a, uh, a school learning track, a learning track in schools, which give them the possibility of actually to talk about something that is uh, uh, related to the school curriculum. Okay. So quick question. The, for instance, you know, one of the synonyms doesn't match the icon. And then in that case, does the building not break? Or because I guess I'm wondering how you guys get the child to then attend to the fact that, oh, well, this must have been the wrong thing or and just kind of doing it on their own. Based off of. So the first, uh, the first, uh, we're very careful to always have a possibility of breaking, but not to break, for instance, as well as, mm -hmm. because there is no on and off here in synonyms, because of course you can, this is a very interesting stuff, because language is, is very flexible, right? So perhaps a uh, word is not a dictionary synonym of another word, but in kids' mind, it, it's related to. So we have done some research on how kids talk about this. And which is interesting here is that there is, the right answer is not in the game, it's in the conversation with the teacher. Uh, so, but we have not stopped it there. Uh, so we have these, what are, we, have, we have the platforms I showed you, the casual games within platforms, and uh, let me, before showing the next step, let me show just some other casual games we have just viewed. Uh, who of you know Lightbot? Uh, Lightbot is, is a very interesting mechanics for teaching programming, actually. Not programming, but concepts of, uh, within programming. Uh, uh, so in Lightbot, you have to control this guy here using those, uh, using steps and turns. It's like a, a very, uh, easy way uh, of easy logo minded oh, thing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's called Lightbot. So nice, uh, Lightbot is very interesting, but it's, uh, as, you, as you send comments to this little guy here, this is our game, right? This is not Lightbot, because in Lightbot, you have to just command this little guy here. We step in the, in, the, in the squares and it lights up, right? If you're right, if you're programming uh, steps are right. In our game, you have to decide how the little guy is to step in the square because it's actually seeding the soil here. So you need like half to <laughs> to complete this here. So so as a step, uh, you have to you have no turn, and then you have to choose from these guys here so what's the next action is. So the kids are using fractions, all right? So, but there is no instruction. So, see, so we, uh, we are very, very concerned about this. There's no instruction about uh, fractions here. And, and just as I said, we're not uh, building instructional objects, but learning objects. And so the kids should uh, trigger uh, some confidence of doing this stuff here. And again, it's within the classroom, in the new social arrangements we're uh, helping to develop that the learning we actually occur. Uh, 
let have uh, like 20 more minutes because uh, of course that that uh, make a much of an effect within the classroom if we didn't do this <laughs> so this is uh, another platform that we have and within it a casual, casual game this one uh, the kid has to uh, control this spaceship within the within the body there are many games actually with the same uh, the very same uh, uh, mechanics and uh, shoot towards bacteria that is inviting this this body the, the, the blood flow right um, so this is sort of a attention trigger so it's interesting it's engaging etc but right, you could the game doesn't stop to show you, oh, this is a mitochondria, this is a cell of this and that. But we, f we follow this with uh, actually what we call enigmas, which are questions based on and names. And names is the national uh, test for uh, competencies uh, in high school. Uh, we take uh, and names uh, uh, performance matrix and we build questions inspired by that matrix that uh, follows from the students' use of the game. And that those questions, that, as you see, are related precisely to that, and then follows a question that is about the same subject, but without the same uh, aesthetics. So we can sort of uh, build a little bit, at least, on, on how kids uh, get away from the game and relate that to the school subject itself, right? So, <laughs> we've done this inspired by uh, things like esports, then international competitions of video games. Uh, so, in, in knowledge Olympics, there are many, plenty of them uh, within the, in the world. Physics, mathematics, and etc. So, collaboration and competition in high performance teams associated with game mechanics of continuous engagement in learning processes. So, we have produced this. So, different social arrangements within the classroom, not only kids engaged, but they're engaged in solving mathematical problems, physics problems, language problems. So, this is in school, this is a real competition. See, the kid is using uh, school equipment like uh, textbooks to solve problems within the game, right? Uh, let me show you before we get to some real research. <laughs> let me show you this uh, uh, TV, uh, actually broadcast news, news broadcast. They, they did about a school performing this. This, this is interesting because we didn't do it, but it's also, I mean, just for you to be advised, it's not research, it's in the media, right? It's broadcast. But it's interesting just so you to show the context in which, uh, which we have been uh, working. Uh, it's got legends in English. Com os joguinhos eletrônicos vistos com desconfiança pelos educadores se tornaram um aliado no aprendizado na rede pública de ensino. Quem vê Ricardo saindo de casa nem imagina que até bem pouco tempo ir à escola era um problemão. Tudo mudou quando os games chegaram à escola. E olha que o garoto de 11 anos foi até marrento. Não achei muito bacana, não. Mas depois meus colegas me motivaram, me chamaram para jogar, aí eles deixaram jogar um pouco e até que eu gostei, me motivei muito. Duas vezes por semana ele se junta aos colegas nesta escola pública de Aracaju para vencer desafios. Quando tem uma pergunta lá e eles querem a resposta, muitas vezes eles chegam na sala questionando, perguntando ao professor sobre aquilo, para eles entenderem e conseguirem responder bem e fazer a pontuação que eles precisam para seguir adiante. É só fazer a série para passar, não, 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 O conhecimento acumulado é usado numa grande disputa. O ano todo acontecem torneios como esse que acumulam pontos para a Olimpíada no final do ano. Cada torneio tem um objetivo específico. 
Nesse, os estudantes estão defendendo os enigmas do português e da matemática. E olha, aqui só tem fera, viu? O projeto Olimpíada Digital foi implantado há pouco mais de um ano em 32 escolas públicas de Aracaju. É uma parceria com a empresa privada de tecnologia, que já existe em outros dois estados do Nordeste. A ideia é simples, um joguinho com outro qualquer. Só que para passar de fase, o aluno tem que responder as perguntas. Todas com base no conteúdo visto em sala de aula. Ajudam mais na minha leitura, no, é, na matemática também. E assim a matemática, que era um bicho de sete cabeças para a Silvia, hoje... Era, mas agora eu fiz ideia de matemática. Nas escolas de Aracaju, em breve, índice que mede a qualidade da educação, ano passado, foi 4.1, com escala de 0 a 10. Ainda é pouco. Mas em 2013 foi 3,6. A Secretaria. de Educação do município atribui em parte essa melhor. Mas também agora eu vou falar mais com a Of course, this is just my view as well. What, uh, the... me? <laughs> Should I stop? Oh, no, it's some others. Uh, we, we go on tier four, at 215, is that? 215. 250, oh, 250, of course. Okay. Um, emphasize education, we, we would like to emphasize education projects that create and sustain opportunities for teacher student interaction and dialogue, as you, as you may have seen. Um, we uh, believe that transformation comes about stronger with the involvement of families and other communities agents, so we, we are uh, uh, trying to sustain that. And enhancing students' agency and self-esteem are critical components for the emergence of new social arrangements within schools. Uh, of course, it, uh, this leaves us with the real challenges. How to monitor and evaluate the efficacy of certain projects across time in large education networks. So I think just give you an example of what we have been doing in this area. Uh, so you've seen in, the, in that video that uh, 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 They're trying to compare IDEB. Uh, IDEB is the national index for evaluating schools and school networks, right? Uh, so we, we are in the same page. Uh, so we've done this uh, study uh, within the Rio de Janeiro state networks uh, for uh, 489 uh, schools. And we, this, the goal of this, the goal of this was not to uh, find a, 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 a causal relationship between OSHA and the, our platforms and uh, learning impact, but to see what if we could find a correlation at all. So, um, so we compared uh, IDEB scores for those uh, 498 schools with uh, various forms and levels of uh, participation in the Olympia, which one of the, one of the products that were there. Uh, so there are several categories, like uh, uh, how many students uh, the school managed to enroll, in the, uh, because it's a voluntary project, right? So kids could go in or not. Uh, how many uh, enrolled students, uh, how many teams, uh, correct answers in enigmas, and things like that. So we had like 14 um, 
different categories for evaluating uh, levels of participation within the, the, the Olympia, right? Okay? Mm -hmm. And we contrasted this with uh, a schools, each one of these schools in that for the, the previous year, right? And we found a very interesting correlation. I mean, uh, this G1 to G5 is the, uh, uh, we divided the, the, the schools in chunks of, uh, equal chunks of 20% of the schools uh, within uh, more participation to less participation in OJ, in the Olympia. And we found uh, this. Uh, we actually created a new index based on our product that correlates significantly with uh, the index, the schools, which is to say that uh, uh, the index we created can be used as an index for exploratory forecast of the performance. So the thing is, uh, schools, school management and the uh, secretary of the state we will know the that like afterwards, right? Two years actually, uh, sometimes, because it's taken uh, uh, only uh, every other year. Uh, with a tool like this, you can not actually predict, but uh, instantiate a, a measure of EDEP based on a project that uh, whose uh, criteria of involvement engagement and correctness on, on enigmas, for instance, replicates conditions that are evaluated within that. Is that clear? So this is so much so that we do create it. Can you go back? Let me just show this so, so it makes a, a little bit more sense. This is so much so that we created actually, based on that study, a tool that uh, school management could uh, actually see the uh, index origin in contrast with that and follow which schools will eventually uh, in a good chance bring the EDEP of the entire network down. So, excuse me, Pedro, I should just to continue. Yeah, no, so my, my question about how this measure, so say basically you have a system of a uh, number of schools, right? Yes, so you have so a you introduce the game in other schools, yes, and they change in the amount of how much they participate. Yeah, right? because it's voluntary. Yeah. So. so some schools are very engaged kids who like to learn more engaged, so they participate a lot, and other schools participate much less. But not only participation, we measured uh, yeah, yeah. correctness in Enigma. Yeah, exactly. Fourteen measures. Yeah. Different so measures. based only on this participation and the result of what of the answer is correct, you are able to forecast what the data will be in a test. Time. <coughs> the test. Yeah. Even if the school doesn't participate, has very low participation, I mean, you are getting a lot less information, right? But st it's still, all, the, just the fact that it's participating a little, less than the others, still already helps with prediction. That's information, because if, if they're not participating, it correlates with a low EDEP. That's interesting to see. Yeah. And these are all uh, uh, significant measures. The variable will be there, but missing data. Yeah. Well, that's information. So, yes. Usually, how does that work? Like, um, students use they use the computer after school or like during the class. Great question. I have a slide about this. Do you just uh, wait a minute? Yeah, okay. <laughs> because I'm gonna get there just to show up other kinds of studies we've done, and I have uh, it's actually my my concluding remarks, and it, the slide is called "What We Have Not Done <laughs> and What's Wrong." What we are doing, right? So I'll, I'll get to it. Thirteen. Great. They have to go, so it starts to... Yeah, so if you go before I finish, please uh, download my presentation. <laughs> and uh, it's because uh, one of the last slides is an a invitation for a call of submissions <laughs> to a book we are editing together, a meeting about. 
So it's there. Uh, we have done other kinds of studies. This is a sort of survey cl uh, dash clinical because we it's a survey that we interviewed individually the kids. And you know, this is just to get a sense of their uh, a feeling about their own participation. So we have some, some data uh, related to this. This was in the state of Acre. Uh, we've done in-depth uh, interviews with uh, many teachers. Uh, this was a study with uh, uh, 25 teachers in the state of Pernambuco. So they would say, I mean, this is sort of a, we do this uh, with bringing my tradition of discourse analysis. <laughs> from uh, the uh, university, but not so much. So it's like, uh, you know, uh, it gets, this actually gets the page of choice to it. <laughs> um, so what they're saying here, basically not to, just to get ahead of my time, is that uh, uh, we get closer to kids, they, they enter more conversation with us. And that's exactly what our plan is, to change uh, schools, social relations. And finally, I mean, we've just now, that as we speak, we are in the Recife's schools network with Plinks, that other platform. Uh, and this is a kind of, uh, this is a very interesting uh, project because we are doing the entire instructional design uh, with the uh, OGEN, the, the Olympics. I mean, it's massive, it's massive. Go and people, were, <laughs> it's, it's a counter turn, a counter shift. Uh, it's not within the classroom. In this, in this, we're doing the instructional design with the teacher. So we go to school and get one uh, class at a time with our instructor that it's our own and works together with the teacher. The teacher has no time to do anything else and there are too many projects in school already. And this is the way we found that we could uh, get the kids together to do things uh, that includes you know, doing things in paper, but this is a mark of the project, but it's, uh, it's interesting because they're solving on paper problems they've seen on the platform, in the platform. Uh, and again, I mean, we're monitoring uh, very closely what kids are doing there. I mean, this is, a, this is the amount of errors they do in the system, basically high. But this is, there is good information in this because see, if, you, if, you, if you look, for instance, the uh, most incorrect answers in math problems uh, are verbal problem solving. And it's very much, as we know from the literature, related to in, uh, not knowing intentionality in this course, for instance, which is the most incorrect answers in the Portuguese area of the platform. So teachers can have very interesting and good information on their own kids and how to access, uh, uh, make an interesting assessment to uh, change the way they're teaching. So in the earlier slide, you said the focus was on improving teacher-student interaction. Yes. But then in the recent slide, when they move down to uh, paper activities, it's student-student. Are you also oh, doing yeah. student-student in the software? No, no, but the, the, the teachers are around here <laughs> somewhere. And then there's, a, as you've seen uh, in, in the uh, video, for instance, the teacher is always uh, answering questions and getting... No, but I think this question is if you are looking at improvements in student-student interaction. Yes, that's the question. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood you. Yes, of course. We are, we are, um, the thing is, we, we don't like to say that uh, all, the, all education should be a student-centered. We, our stance, theoretically, at least, is that it's uh, on teacher-student interaction. Of course, we, to this to happen, we have to have collaboration within the classroom among students as well. So, so that would be a dotted line as opposed to a strong line. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Sure. I was also curious, you mentioned dialogue is a central part of the B3 things. How, how, do you, how do you get teachers to talk to the kids about what they do in the games and do you, do you try actively to uh, mediate that or? Actually not, because I mean, the, the idea is that this project be the more scalable as we can. Sure. So it's like a bottom up mm -hmm. uh, emergent uh, activity where kids, we design this within the platform, kids have to team up but the teams can only be validated by a teacher. Okay. So we call them allied teachers. 
and the kids have to invite the teachers to participate because we know that the other way around coming from from the principal i mean teachers have too many projects already to take care of and this uh, we we thought that coming from uh, the students uh, that uh, uh, that would be more interesting and it really is not in the way not in the uh, amount we'd like to but it's uh, have helped a lot mm. and so Sabini, <laughs> what we did not do and what's not working. <laughs> Running quantitative studies of a single project performance across a school network has proven very difficult. I, I didn't even know this. Number of projects, uh, because of the number of projects implemented at the same time by different players in Rio de Janeiro, for instance, uh, at the time we ran that uh, single study I showed you about, there were 90 educational projects in the school network. This is crazy. Uh, and of course, uh, by different players, so they don't share information. We don't share information. <laughs> and so we cannot uh, uh, evaluate uh, in const uh, contrasting uh, the things. So the short duration of our own intervention, sometimes the government hires us for a year. Nothing <laughs> to change anything. And lack of resources to hire independent, expert independent groups to implement more sophisticated studies. All we've done, we've done ourselves. So the government hires you for years. So what's the main funding for the firm? Oh, uh, government is, is about 40% of our of what we do. And the other 60? Uh, corporations. We, we work with Unilever, FCA, with another staff. This is multinationals, but also Brazilian? Uh, publishers, we've done work for publishers in Brazil too. But we, this, all this work I've, I've shown today is for basic education and our own projects. Uh, and uh, we have this uh, 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 platform for professional education. I didn't show any of it, but it's a fourth project we have that's for training corporations using gamification. We always, uh, it's, uh, gamification and game mechanics are our, our thing. <clears throat> and just to finish, because I think it's uh, about time, uh, many schools fail to participate uh, adequately because nobody from the staff volunteers as allied teachers. So those are the G5 schools. Mm -hmm. so this is information for lack of data. Since our projects have not yet entered school as curricular units, we always work on the counter tour. How, how after, after, after school, school program? Yeah, of course. Uh, time of students' engagement with the platforms uh, disputes heavily with traditional classroom activities and the use of the computational resources. And of course, B2G in Brazil, uh, I mean, probably every, everywhere in the world, is highly problematic, very long purchase cycles, discontinuity of projects across governments, not the same thing about uh, all the more heavy and <laughs> hairy stuff. And and this is where I'm going right now. I mean, we, I'm, I've, I've done lots of problem-based learning before Choice Street. Choice Street is basically game-based learning. And I'm getting within Choice Street, actually, to uh, imagination-based learning. <laughs> That's a, a concept we've been uh, struggling to create. Uh, and this is exemplified by what we call the coding games, which is, just to give you a hint, a, uh, uh, a programming learning environment based on uh, tangible programming <coughs> in a very, uh, I don't know if it's not, but <laughs> anyways, uh, kids will follow a, a, a fiction novel in YouTube and there will be mysteries here that they can only solve within, uh, as, a, as they program a, this board game, right? And uh, the answers to those things are then given by a augmented reality application, right? So, but this, this is one phase of the thing, but because we want to distribute freely within public school networks in Brazil, we'll have an entire uh, analogical uh, mirror of this cycle here. The, the fiction novel can also uh, be distributed in uh, comic books. And, uh, and uh, the, the, yeah, the application here can be just a, 
are reading a decoding manual that teacher, teachers or adults can read for the kid and get to that. And this is that. I mean, this is the, the copper papers we're producing together, me and Paolo. Uh, if you enter here, in case uh, underlying lemon, uh, you see the, the instructions. And thank you, everybody. I tried to link it, it doesn't seem to work. What? Um, I, I tried no. no. What did you do? Beat dot L Y dash meta lemon. M E I R A L E M A N N. No. Is it supposed to be dot between bit and read? There is. Yeah. I tested this like. The other ones work. I downloaded it again. This is not on the Before we, we have to go, I just wanted to thank uh, Cristiano again. And uh, I was supposed to be here at the start, but we have a, we had an admissions meeting today, so I had to stay into the two. So I'm sorry for sure. Not no problem. to be here uh, at 1 30, but I guess I'll see you all next week at 1 30. And thanks again. And I guess we'll fix the. I'll, I'll fix the. I'll fix also, it. if you know people that might be good candidates for the book.